Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast, focusing on what's important to the total Army community. We bring vital Army conversations and interviews on issues relevant to soldiers, military families, and all of you amazing Army supporters. Rotating each week, our show includes Soldier Today, Leading Great Teams, Family Voices, and Thought Leaders. Let's tune into the show. I arrived in Mogadishu on December 17, 1992. One of my duties was to facilitate meetings of local leaders. Almost daily, I would head off across town accompanied by a young foreign service officer and a Somali driver who carried an AK-47 and chewed constantly on the narcotic cot, a ubiquitous Somali stimulant. Looking back, these excursions seemed utterly harebrained. On one occasion, we were stopped by a primitive roadblock north of the Green Line. Suddenly, a Toyota pickup truck mounting a heavy machine gun and carrying some eight militiamen appeared from the side alley. I got out, along with my State Department colleague, leaving my rifle in the vehicle and my pistol holstered. Suddenly, a Somali male dismounted and came towards us on foot, brandishing a rocket launcher on his shoulder. My diplomatic sidekick yelled something in Somali, but the man still approached. At about 50 meters, can't miss range, he brought it up to firing position with his finger on the trigger. I quickly ran through my options. I could shoot him, but he could pull the trigger faster than I could get my weapon out, and his friends would kill us if the rocket didn't. We could run, but my driver would likely be killed, and we would be cut off, on foot, and isolated. We could try to talk our way out, but my colleague had been doing that for several minutes with no effect. As a crowd formed, I found myself desperately wishing I had about 100 U.S. paratroopers with me, but I didn't. Thoroughly frightened, I watched in amazement as an elderly-looking Somali man pushed through the crowd to confront the gunman. Carrying a long, slender stick, he shouted at my adversary, beating him across the arms and shoulders with the stick. In the distance, his friends laughed merrily. After a moment, the gunman sheepishly lowered the launcher and ambled away. Clearing away the roadblock, we continued on our way. That night, U.S. Special Envoy Robert Oakley chuckled as I told him the story. Ah, he was just having fun with you. These boys aren't going to take on the USA unless the big guys tell them to. And that's not going to happen. Hello everyone, I'm Joe Craig, and welcome to this episode of Army Matters. That clip you just heard is a reenactment of a tense moment experienced by Colonel R.D. Hooker Jr. from his just-released book, The Good Captain, A Personal Memoir of America at War. With over 30 years in uniform, Colonel Hooker was part of operations in Grenada, Somalia, Bosnia, and Kosovo, as well as Iraq and Afghanistan. Across his career, he commanded paratroopers at the company, battalion, and brigade level. He also taught at West Point, served in several high-level Pentagon assignments, and worked in the White House for four separate administrations. Colonel Hooker has written and edited six other books, along with numerous articles, but The Good Captain is his first book detailing his own experiences in service. Colonel Hooker, welcome to Army Matters. Thanks, Joe. It's great to be here. Well, you've had a a long and varied career going from the post-Vietnam Army to the global war on terror. And one of my colleagues, a young enlisted soldier, was particularly struck by the descriptions of your early days in service. So what inspired you to join the first place, and, and how different was the Army back then? Well, a military career wasn't initially my long-term plan. I joined the Army because the GI Bill offered an affordable way to maybe one day go to college. My father was a career Army officer, so I, I was an Army brat and was sort of brought up in the Army culture and way of life. And I probably was looking for a little bit of excitement and adventure. I knew I needed a little bit of discipline. And a a short three-year enlistment seemed like a great way to accomplish all of those things. But it it turned into a 32-year career. So you went to West Point and and did commission as an officer to go on to a great career. You know, you rose through the ranks and retired as a colonel after more than 30 years in uniform, as you say. So considering that you retired as a colonel, why is the book called The Good Captain? Well, as I describe in one of the earlier chapters in the book, uh, I was on an exercise in the middle of an Alabama swamp in the 
in the middle of the night one time as a young company commander and a uh, young soldier was complaining about the exercise. We had just done a, a night parachute drop and a very long road march with lots of heavy equipment. And uh, now he found himself in the middle of a swamp and he wasn't happy about it. And a young NCO, unaware that I was uh, standing nearby, uh, said, you know, the the captain, he's he's a good captain. He's just trying to train you for war. And you need to stop complaining and get on with it. I'm paraphrasing, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And in a long career, I, I, I just really felt that was one of the, the most meaningful accolades I, I ever received. One of the special things about soldiering that sticks in your memory after many, many long years. Well, a- after that uh, tenure as a company commander, you went on to teach at West Point and uh, then headed over to the White House. Now, I'm, I'm curious, how did a White House fellowship lead to you coming under fire for the first time? Well, it's a great story. And and I think I'm probably maybe the only White House fellow that ever got deployed to a war zone. I began my fellowship year at the tail end of the Bush 41 administration. And after the election in early November, as you'll appreciate, the work really winds down as people begin to look for new jobs and and the transition gets underway. One day at the end of the Bush 41 administration, my boss came back from the White House mess and told me he'd had a conversation with an NSC official named Richard Clark, and I needed to go see him, which I did. And Clark said, we've just gone into Somalia. The ambassador, Bob Oakley, needs a military assistant. They tell me that you don't have much to do so we want you to go to Somalia and uh, and work for him. And not knowing any better, I, I said, yes, sir. And the next night I found myself on a C-5 headed to Mogadishu. Uh, I forgot to tell the Army, uh, though, so I got in a little bit of trouble after that. One of the more fascinating things in the book is, is how at various points in your career, you weren't afraid to push back against orders. For example, when your battalion was posted to the Sinai, you refused to fly a colonel to a requested spot, right? So for our younger officers listening, how do you know when to refuse an order? Well, that's an interesting question. In this particular case, this superior officer was in the wrong, I thought. He was asking for helicopters to fly to Tehran Island so that they could draw hazardous duty pay, he and his party. It was the only location in the Sinai where hazardous duty pay was authorized, I think because of a line on the map. I had seen this before in other deployments I thought it was wrong, frankly, ethically wrong. And so I I called him on it. Uh, I didn't exactly refuse the order, though. I said, if you want to visit all the other outposts in the middle of the Sinai Desert every month, you're welcome to visit Tehran Island as well. But that was 15 remote locations in the middle of the desert in 125 degrees. And he wasn't too keen about doing that. So in that particular case, I, I came out ahead, I think. Well, that's a smart way to go about it. Another technique you used to deal with orders that were unethical or dangerous was to come up with a compromise, most notably during your time as company commander with the Pathfinders. Yes, he was my brigade commander, and we were doing an external evaluation, which involved a a parachute jump from a caribou, which was a Vietnam-era small fixed-wing airplane. And the colonel had flown this aircraft as a young officer in Vietnam some 15 years before. And uh, uh, probably for reasons of nostalgia, he wanted to fly this mission as well. The problem was he was a a helicopter pilot and he wasn't uh, checked out to drop troops, which is a a special training sequence that pilots are supposed to go through to be certified. And I really thought I was looking out for my brigade commander as well as for my soldiers. You'll appreciate if, if anything goes wrong on an airborne operation, no matter how minor, really, there are all kinds of investigations. It was a safety issue for me, but it was also a uh, professional uh, risk for him as well. So as politely as I could, I explained the situation and, and said I really didn't think it made a lot of sense for him or for us to go through with this. So he flew the mission, uh, but did not take the controls until after we dropped. So everybody was happy in the end. And and I, I appreciated his forbearance and common sense. Once it was explained to him, he was very supportive and didn't hold it against me, which is uh, also nice. Yeah, that is a good example of wise leadership. We're going to take a quick break now. 
But when we return, we'll find out how Colonel Hooker stood up to the Criminal Investigations Division over the loss of $50,000 in cash. Did you know, as a member of AUSA, you have access to many benefits? From car rental to entertainment discounts, the opportunities are ample. Visit AUSA.org slash benefits to learn more. We're back with Colonel R.D. Hooker Jr., author of his just-released book, The Good Captain, a personal memoir of America at War. You talk quite a bit in the book about non-commissioned officers and their role in leadership. Nick Keen is one you mention quite often. Can you tell us more about your working relationship with him? I met him uh, in the early 80s when I was a young anti-tank platoon leader. He was assigned as my driver. And over the course of a long career, I think we served together four or five times. As I rose in rank, I was able to influence his assignment to my units. And I always found him uh, just a fount of common sense and wisdom. It's kind of a heroic figure. I think he had gone through something like seven combat deployments, was very severely injured on a parachute drop. They had to put a titanium rod in his thigh. And after that, he went through the Special Operations Medical Course and served several tours in Afghanistan with Special Forces. So a really remarkable individual and one I, I came to rely upon and lean upon in difficult situations, but also in some dark days. And I think most officers and most commanders will tell you that some of their most golden moments come with their interaction and their professional relationships with non-commissioned officers. Absolutely. One other crucial aspect of good leadership is protecting the people that are entrusted to you. We have lots of examples uh, in, in the book. But one that stands out for me is uh, your time leading the Sky Dragons in Iraq. There was an incident involving a, a Hawaii National Guardsman and the Army Criminal Investigations Division. And that one stands out for me because you stuck your neck out, not because you knew the guy personally necessarily, but because his commander vouched for him. Would you share that story and, and tell us how you developed those levels of trust? Uh, yes. First of all, I had three National Guard battalions that were task organized under me. The infantry battalion from the Hawaii National Guard, they did an operation, a raid, which uncovered, among other things, uh, a massive amount of cash, which the CID agents on the scene took charge of. And later, uh, it was reported that some $50,000 had gone missing. And the initial CID inquiry uh, placed the blame on the first lieutenant who had led the operation. And after consulting with the battalion commander, Ken Hara, I became convinced that the fault did not lie with the unit or with the officer, but elsewhere. And it took some strong measures to achieve the right outcome. But in the end, the missing money was located. It had nothing to do with the officer or the unit. One of those times, I think, where commanders really need to step up when they're convinced that they know the facts and they're in the right you sometimes need to push the envelope a little bit to ensure that there's a fair and a right outcome. It's great to see how you got a separate investigation to make sure justice was done. Now, in addition to your time in the field, you had many high-level assignments. You worked in the Pentagon with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, with the Army Chief of Staff, the Secretary of the Army. Which of those assignments was most meaningful to you? Well, they were all rewarding in their own way. And it's difficult to choose. I was a special assistant to General Shelton when he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And many years before, he had been my brigade commander, and I had gotten to know him fairly well in that assignment. So it was special for me to be able to come back and work in his inner office and to be close to him for two years. But I also treasure my time working for Secretary of the Army, Tom White, a wonderful human being. And, and really love soldiers and love the Army as an institution. And you were with him on 9-11, right? Yes, he, he was the Secretary of the Army on 9-11. We actually had just left the, the building after the, the World Trade Center had been struck and were about a mile away when the airplane flew right over us. So we saw it seconds before it impacted the Pentagon. And he rushed right back to the building and went down to the Army Operations Center. So we were there for that whole terrible day. And I describe it in some detail in the book. I thought his, his leadership was remarkable for all the stress and 
and the drama that was going on, he was cool and calm and composed and very much in charge in, in that awful day. He was one of many that stood up to help guide the country that day. And your account of it in the book's remarkable. Now, in your final assignment, you were deployed to Afghanistan again, but this time your son was there. How did you balance the role of parent and officer? Yeah, I, I think that was probably my most difficult year. I thought I was on a retirement assignment teaching at the National War College, but my former commander and mentor, General Scaparotti, asked me to uh, go with the division. It would be my final year on active duty, and my son had just enlisted with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, so I was aware that he would be in, in Regional Command East with us at the same time. And on the one hand, it was uh, very special uh, to serve on active duty with my son, who was 20 years old at the time, but obviously very, very stressful. This unit was in a lot of contacts. He had any number of near escapes. And so that's very stressful. And I thought I had understood what parents go through, but it's a new dimension when it's your own child. So very challenging and, and very difficult, but also very, very special for us. And I'll always be grateful he, he came through that experience in one piece. Right. Of course. Now, the thing about the book is, you know, I, I love how your love for the army and for the country really comes through. It's a book full of great stories, and there's also a lot of funny moments throughout. Would you share, a, you know, a favorite anecdote that shows the lighter side of an army career? Probably my favorite story has to do with uh, the time I was tasked as a second lieutenant to run a rifle range, and the range tower was an old World War II wooden structure. It's covered with about 50 coats of paint. And right as the general came up to inspect the range, I knocked over a camp stove I was brewing some coffee on and set the tower on fire. And I had to actually jump out of the tower really to avoid being burned to death. And I think I did a, one of the best parachute landing falls I'd ever done in my career. Landed right in front of the general with my field jacket smoldering and uh, gave him a snappy salute and uh, announced that I was Second Lieutenant Hooker, the officer in charge of the range, and I was ready to brief him on the day's training. And, and right about then, the tower collapsed in a, a mass of heaping, smoldering, charred timbers. Uh, and I'll never forget, he just gave me a slight smile and said, carry on, Lieutenant, and got in his Jeep and drove away. And uh, could have blasted my career, I suppose, but he chose not to. So. I was saved to contribute, you know, down down the line. I'm I'm grateful for that. I'm I'm so glad you picked that uh, rifle range anecdote because uh, that was one of my favorites. I told that to my kids at the dinner table the other day, and uh, my daughter Rebecca was like, "Oh, that's <laughs> that's something else." Because you know, I was saying how like you were standing there and like flames were rising behind you. <laughs> Look, I'll be honest with you. Probably eight or nine senior leaders out of ten would not have reacted that way. My guess is the general who's probably remembering some similar episode in his younger days. Mm -hmm. That's how I account for it. Absolutely. It's a great story, and I'm glad you shared it with our listeners today. Colonel Oker, thanks for coming on to the show and telling us all about your experiences. It's my pleasure, Joe. Thanks so much. R.D. Hooker's new book is The Good Captain, a personal memoir of America at war. It's available at bookstores and online everywhere. I'm Joe Craig from AUSA's book program. Thanks for listening. Have a great Army Day. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army Day. Hua. <laughs>